Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Mathieu Denoyer. I work at uh, Efficios. Uh, this afternoon, I want to discuss uh, uh, restartable sequences. Uh, how can we add uh, support for it in glibc as well as uh, uh, GDB, actually? So uh, I'll first introduce uh, what are restartable sequences, discuss use cases, present benchmarks, discuss the Linux integration, uh, the ongoing glibc integration effort, uh, discuss requirements, missing pieces, open issues, and ongoing work. So what is a restartable sequence? So uh, it is a Linux kernel system call that allows a, a thread local storage area uh, to be registered on a per-thread basis. And this acts as an ABI between the kernel and user space. And it does allow user space to perform updates on per-CPU data very efficiently. Uh, so, uh, basically, we achieve the atomicity of critical section with respect to the scheduler activity, so preemption, by aborting the critical sections uh, when they are either preempted or the, if there's a signal delivered on top of them. So, we do this, so this abort, rather than disabling preemption. Well, because basically the scheduler people would really not like having user space disabling preemption or migration. Uh, so, uh, what does the RSEC structure members look like? So, we have at the top level, a, in a thread local storage area, a RSEC ABI. Uh, so, that's tracked RSEC. So, there are a few fields, but I'm really focusing on the most important. So, there is a current CPU ID. So, that CPU ID is always kept current by the kernel. So, whenever user space fetches that value, it knows on which CPU ID it was running. And this is actually faster than the, the get CPU VDSO. Uh, there's also a RSEC CS, the current critical section of RSEC. So this is populated by user space by storing a pointer to the current struct RSEC CS that describes the current critical section uh, in which user space is. So that critical section can be seen here in orange, and this is usually an inline assembly. So that critical section has a start instruction pointer it has a post commit offset from the start instruction pointer, so it has a length, basically. And it has an abort IP pointer. So how the kernel will behave if it preempts a thread uh, that has a current uh, RSEC critical section set, and it's actually within the range of the critical section, uh, so it, it, I'm saying preempt, but it could be signal delivery as well. So it's going to change the instruction pointer of that thread, so the return IP that it would return to when going back to user space, to move it to the abort handler, uh, therefore uh, aborting the, that current critical section. So some use cases uh, that are enabled by uh, introducing restartable sequences. So having memory allocators that have per CPU pools, uh, rather than having the choice to do either a global or per thread, uh, or having a mix of the two with per thread caches, uh, so that can be done per, uh, per CPU. And here, when I say per CPU, it's kind of per logical CPU. You can see it as per core uh, in terms of uh, system, or even by, uh, per, uh, per hardware thread. So uh, per having per CPU ring buffers, uh, very useful for tracing. This is one of my particular goal to use it for the LTTNG USD tracer. Having per CPU statistics accounting. So uh, again, if you so you can have global counters that are updated with at atomic operations. On the other end of the spectrums, uh, you can have per thread in TLS uh, uh, counters for statistics, which consumes a lot of useless memory in many cases. So uh, the in-between solution is to declare those counters as per CPU, and then you can update them very efficiently with uh, restartable sequences. Uh, another thing, uh, so I maintain the user space or CU library. So I, I have a prototype branch introducing uh, grace period tracking uh, with, uh, uh, I would say, scoped read copy update domains, and this is done with a per CPU data structure. So if we want to have uh, an efficient read side in that case, uh, RSEC enables that. On ARM64, ARC64, uh, on Big Little, they have issues with uh, reading performance monitoring unit counters from user space. Uh, since this is done in a sequence of instructions, and the fact that uh, not all cores have the same capabilities, if they get migrated between, within that sequence, they can actually uh, hit a trap. Yeah. So RSEC take, takes care of that 
by aborting them when they get migrated so they never trap. There are also some very interesting uh, improvements that can be done to spin locks type of data uh, of synchronization mechanisms in user space. First of all, RSEC uh, can track preemption. So you could put your busy spin a loop within a critical RSEC critical section and get aborted whenever you get preempted. So that's information that is currently very hard to get in user space. And you kind of have to guess and put delays and uh, uh, do a certain number of loops uh, hoping that uh, it, it matches your system uh, timings. Also, it could be used for uh, spin lock NUMA awareness. So the, this is not there now, but I would like eventually to do some extension to the RSEC ABI to add uh, the node ID uh, in there. So that could provide a fast accessor to know the current node ID as well. Uh, yeah. Some benchmarks. So those are really more in the kind of micro benchmarks. Uh, as just as a general statement there. So at the left, we have ARM32. We're comparing in blue the get CPU system call with the glibc get CPU and reading from the RSEC CPU ID. We can notice that going through glibc actually adds a significant overhead compared to just invoking syscall on ARM32 because GLibc, the glibc wrapper basically invokes the system call. <laughs> so you get the function call and the system call. So compared to that, reading the CPU ID field is, uh, so it takes uh, 16 nanoseconds compared to two or 300 nanoseconds. That's the DSL though, right? Uh, the, the 300 one? Yeah. All of this is VDSO. Not ARM32. It does not have the VDSO. Oh, okay. Right. So that it's calling the kernel from the, okay. the glibc function. Okay. Uh, on, on Intel, however, uh, if we look at uh, XCD664, which has the VDSO, so doing the, just the syscall invocation, 50-ish uh, nanoseconds, uh, doing the VDSO, so we're actually calling glibc, which is calling the VDSO, so there are two level of functions there, so 16 nanoseconds. And uh, reading the CPU ID TLS field, 0 0.8 nanosecond. So this is a significant improve, improvement. Actually, I have one patch in my patch set which changes sked get CPU to use the CPU ID field if it is available and populated. And we, so we get part of that performance Im improvement because just the function call actually has significant overhead compared to the, those 0 0.8 nanoseconds. But I mean, that, that's already better than the 16. Uh, and by, by the way, those 16 nanoseconds, a large part of it is the LSL instruction used on Intel, uh, which is not that fast. So it's uh, how the VDSO is implemented. Uh, other uh, comparison of use cases, statistics counters. So comparing a get CPU and doing an atomic operation with uh, RSEC. On ARM32, so we have a 10x factor improvement. On XTD664, uh, about factor eight, uh, going from 15 to two nanoseconds. Uh, and then for the ring buffer, so we have to understand here, the LTTNG USD ring buffer, there are three things uh, from which it benefits uh, from RSEC. So first of all, speeding up reading the current CPU number. The second thing is uh, speeding up reserving space in the, in the ring buffer, uh, which can go from an, an, atomic, uh, an interlocked atomic operation, for instance, on Intel, uh, to uh, RSEC, uh, which has just loads and stores, uh, and speeding up the commit which is pretty much similar for the, in terms of going from an atomic operation to RSEC. So, I mean, this is a bit less uh, impressive than the other micro benchmarks, but this one is kind of more realistic. Uh, so we go from uh, 2.5 microseconds per operation on ARM32 to 2.2, and on XCD664 in nanoseconds, we go from 117 down to 98. But still, I mean, this is very good improvements to get for an already pretty much optimized LTTNG USD. Uh, so getting those improvements is, is, is hard. Uh, so in terms of integration into Linux, uh, so RSEC has been merged in Linux 418. It's been wired up for uh, XCD6, PowerPC, and MIPS, both 32 and 64, ARM 32, and then in 419 we had uh, uh, we added wired up for ARM64 and S390, uh, the 32-bit and 64-bit variants. So uh, in terms of integration with it, within glibc, so we have worked uh, uh, quite a lot in the past year to uh, try to uh, get this integrated. 
So uh, what we want integrated in GLibc, first of all, is handling of the registration and unregistration of the RSEC ABI TLS automatically within GLibc on C startup and when a thread is created and unregistered when a thread exits. And the other part is uh, exposing public headers that have RSEC signatures. Uh, so this is a, a non-common by, four-byte signature that needs to be uh, placed before abort handlers and uh, its, its use is for security. We basically want to prevent attackers from using the RSEC mechanism as a mean to redirect the execution flow to any arbitrary code in the program. So the kernel validates that this signature is actually present just before the instruction pointer of the abort. So, uh, so someone could re redirect or uh, use RSEC to redirect the code, but it could only redirect within uh, abort handlers, which uh, quite, uh, kind of limits a little bit what an attacker can do with this. So, uh, so that uh, RSEC signature is typically never executed. Uh, ideally, it should trap if it is reached, but it should never be reached uh, if the uh, invalid code. Uh, and uh, ideally, it should provide a valid instruction within OBG dump, or at least not confuse OBG dump. That would be my minimal requirement. So, in terms of requirements, uh, so we want to have RSEC uh, be usable uh, both in applications and libraries. We want to use it in signal landers, uh, which includes the tricky part where it can nest uh, very early and late over the thread lifetime where RSEC might not be registered yet. Uh, and the other use case we have is to use it in library constructors and destructors. Uh, and we run into issues where uh, basically the dynamic linker have trouble accessing the thread local storage early uh, before the invoking the library constructors. Uh, so any would need to access it to perform the RSEC registration. Um, so other requirements we have, so allowing internal use within GLibc, we expect at some point uh, that uh, the GLibc allocator might have uh, a need for it. Uh, so we, I've uh, pushed the patch modifying get, get CPU to access it, uh, and then it falls back on uh, the VDSO if that doesn't work, uh, which in turn falls back to the system call, of course. Uh, and then uh, for locking, so that can be uh, useful as well. Um, and then another requirement uh, would, uh, I have is to provide a smooth integration of RSEC uh, within the user space ecosystem. So today, I have projects that would like to leverage the existence of RSEC at the kernel level, but I have customers who may not plan to upgrade GLibc before, I don't know, six, eight years. So I would like to introduce RSEC directly within a, uh, some projects but I don't want those projects to break when the, the end users upgrade to newer GLibcs. So, other missing pieces. Uh, we have some GDB uh, maintainers in the room. So, GDB support. So, one tricky part about RSEC from a debugger perspective is that if the debugger tries to single step within a RSEC critical section, it's always going to hit the abort because it will itself, uh, through the, the trap, uh, preempt the critical section. So if RSEC use a kind of a, a, a loop retry as an abort handling mechanism, well, you end up with no progress. You try to single step the first instruction of RSEC, go to the abort, come back, and it never ends. So the approach I'm proposing here is to basically have the, uh, the debugger skip the RSEC critical sections, uh, similarly uh, to what is done for uh, load link store conditional on various architectures. Only, I mean, the, the, I, I've seen the code that does the LLSC uh, uh, skip, and I mean, this is pretty much heuristics, right? It's looking at code patterns, it expects specific code patterns, but I mean, it's far from generic. Uh, here we have uh, the luxury to create something new, and what I've done is within the li uh, library headers that uh, emit the R set critical sections, I made sure to populate uh, uh, information about all the entry and exit point of every RSEC critical sections. Uh, and this is put in a, in a section that's available to debuggers. So the debuggers could use that section to track every entry and exit point of RSEC and therefore skip them. Same thing for an emulator. Emulators, if they need to single step somehow to a critical section, they might have to skip it. 
uh, other missing pieces, so the RSEC GLIBC integration. So currently, uh, we are missing consensus on the RSEC handled symbol, uh, and its main aim is to allow applications and library to use RSEC with old GLIBC uh, and provide a smooth upgrade path. So it could be removed uh, if uh, we solve a few problems we have currently in GLIBC, which are those open issues. Uh, first of all, the fact that signals are enabled on Thread Startup uh, when RSEC is not registered yet. So RSEC is not, in terms of kernel ABI, so it's not part of clone. It's not a new clone flag, it's not a clone 10, right? Um, so it's, it's its own system call, so it's not atomic with the creation of the thread. So you run into a time window be between this, the moment the thread starts execu executing and RSEC registration, where uh, signal handlers can nest. So we have discussed perhaps uh, making sure that uh, signals are disabled on uh, thread startup. Uh, would be, that would be an option. Uh, the other thing is uh, that TLS cannot be touched by the dynamic linker code. Uh, and this is needed if we want uh, RSEC to be usable from uh, library constructors. And this is kind of unrelated to the uh, GNU side, but on my side, uh, what I want to pursue, my ongoing work, is to allow concurrent update of remote per CPU data. So RSEC is pretty good at saying, okay, I want to touch this, the, the, the per CPU data structure of the CPU on which I currently run on. But let's say you have a use case where, you, well, so you have a memory allocator with per CPU arenas, uh, uh, so you have those, that, that batch of free memory per CPU that you can uh, allocate from. And then you have a CPU that gets un, uh, unplugged. Ideally, you'd want something to, not if, to notice this and uh, reclaim that, that free memory and use it for something else in the, in the system. But nothing prevents that CPU from going back online again. So you, so you end up wanting to touch the per CPU data of a remote CPU in a situation where there can be concurrent access. First of all, there, there can be many CPUs who wish to touch that per CPU data, that other per CPU data, and that CPU may also come back online. So this, those are op open issues uh, that I'm currently working on solving, which require uh, kernel uh, improvements. Uh, and the use case for this uh, one is uh, the LTTNG consumer daemon, which requires to write into per each per CPU ring buffers when it does a per periodical uh, timer flush. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, setting CPU affinity does not solve this because C CPU affinity is not CPU at plug aware. Uh, it's just a hint and the kernel does tons of weird stuff when there's CPU at plug uh, happening with uh, CPU affinity. Uh, and yeah, I just told about the case of uh, cleaning up free memory after a, a CPU is uh, unplugged. So, time for a question. Yep. Are there any, oh, sorry. Are there any uh, forward guarantees? So, uh, could it be that you always get them aborted? Uh, there are no guarantees of uh, forward progress. Um, yeah, that, that's a very valid question. So let's go back. Let's so, go back. Of, of course, that would make uh, debugging support simple. Because yep. then you just always abort and the program has to handle that. Excellent. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's true. Um, so I, I came up with uh, something I presented at Linux Plumbers uh, conference earlier this week. Uh, which is basically a bytecode interpreter in the kernel that can be used as a fallback solution when RSEC aborts. Um, so it basically it does the critical, it, so it expresses the critical section in eBPF bytecode, passes it to the kernel, and the kernel does it. So that provides forward progress guarantee. But they found it was kind of a big hammer to uh, hit a very, very small nail. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it might not be accepted, but it works. It does work. And it handles all the CPU outplug and remote per CPU accesses and everything. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, from the GLIPC side, I think the way forward is try to help you to get rid of RSEC handled, and basically it's our job to, to provide the required infrastructure for doing so. 
Um, what's missing in the slides, and I think it will be discussed briefly on the main list, we also need to deal with DLM open and audit modules. Because uh, with the current implementation, what happens is that if you have an audit module, basically the audit module grabs the RSEC registration and it's no longer available for the main program. And that's not what we want. I think you want it the other way around. The main program gets to use the RSEC stuff and the audit module can't use it. And the reason for that is that um, because the threat local allocation is, the threat local data reservation happens for libc and libc isn't shared uh, between audit modules or across DLM open. So mm. uh, you have one process global, uh, you have one choice uh, for the RSEC area per process, but uh, you have multiple libc copies, so it's not going to work. So if I understand correctly, the audit module has its own separate copy of the RSEC ABI symbol, and you don't want to I it to hijack yeah, the exactly, RSEC registration. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that runs within the same threads as the actual program. Uh, so uh, basically what happens, we don't have uh, context switches between the threads. The, the, the audit module runs on the same thread. It just have, has different code addresses. And uh, at that point, uh, because the, 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 the symbol it lives in libc, uh, it's not shared. And the other issue is that uh, if, you have, if you use the RSEC area from the main program, at least on x86, x you basically pin it at a fixed offset from the uh, TLS segment rect register. And that would actually work, uh, that, uh, that there's, uh, there's just not, not, not enough wiggle room there to, to, to do something else there. Yeah. So for the audit case, uh, is, the, do you pro uh, is your proposal to Ensure that the, the, the RSEC ABI that is exposed to the program side is always registered first. And then if a noted module try to register, uh, it, it either do, just don't try to register since this is libc code that it knows uh, this is uh, using an audit RSEC. Is that what you're... Thinking? So uh, I think in, in a sense, yes, but I think the actual mechanism is going to be a little, bit, a little different because uh, we also need the pre-init uh, hook in libc. We, we, the idea is to put the RSEC registration into libc against the libc symbol uh, and put that into a function that's called from the dynamic loader before the ELF constructors are run for yeah. any, any ELF object. So you, don't, you have no way of observing that there's an unregistered RSEC area. And we would do the registration in both cases, I think for audit modules and for, uh, uh, for the main LIPC. But we have a flag so that, um, that, that if, if the flag indicates it's an audit module use case, we wouldn't do the RSEC registration. Uh, we also need the same mechanism to fix a couple of other bugs. So there would be more code in the same function that does something else which is not RSEC related. And I think that this is not too bad in terms of uh, layering violations and all that kind of stuff. We need to see the actual code, but uh, uh, it, if we do it correctly, we can remove a cross hack from two other places in the library. So it's an overall win. We, we already have uh, uh, bits of initialization we need to skip or handle differently for malloc and libio vtable hardening, which run in the, into the same problem basically with the multiple libc instances. Okay. So we need to fix that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, what I, I'm, uh, this is, I'm, I'm trying, I'm just trying, maybe someone here in the audience is interested in what goes on there, but it's not a, a list of, a laundry list for you. That's just what I think we need to do on, on the library side. So I hope to get to that in October and there get it is. done well in time before for the December crunch for the next release. What about the uh, simple long distance 
the I think the, for for the the P thread thing, I, I think we should just uh, take the performance hit and do this a uh, single handle, um, and on the single handle the, the single mask manipulation in the code. I, I have looked at that, and we are already do we already call sig proc mask on the new thread in some cases. Um, we just need to make it an unconditional and uh, fix the maps. That should, should also simplify the code a little bit. And if there's a latency issue uh, with the additional system call in the uh, thread creating thread, I think we need to talk to Christian Brauner, I think is his name, because he's working on, on, a, on, a, on a clone extension and we just uh, request that we get a flag that allows us to disable the single handlers in a new thread unconditionally. Uh, fork doesn't have the problem because uh, you keep the registration on fork. There's some clone flags that are currently yeah. under discussion upstream with the kernel maintainers where uh, you you where it's, un, where it's unclear whether you keep the registration. But on fork, um, we fork is yeah we fork is special very special. I mean for we fork. Uh, if you v fork for an active ASIC area, I would say the behavior is fairly undefined. That, that's something for you to test. I don't know what the kernel can do in this case. I mean, it can't really abort because then the abort will run on, on the wrong on the wrong PID. Yeah. Yeah. So currently, what we do uh, so the the current kernel implementation uh, in terms of clone flags is that on clone thread it resets uh, the RSEC registration for the thread. However, I'm currently in discussion on a pri private thread with Google guys where they have a use case where they explicitly use clone VM without clone thread. And they end up, well, it should have cleared it, right? Because uh, it's really not good to have that other thread being able to poke into a, the, the, the parent thread uh, um, RSEC TLS. So I'm currently looking into, but the thing is, we have released kernels that have this behavior, so it kind of becomes ABI. The fact that clone thread does clear the RSEC registration, and if you have kind of other odd use cases, you might as well want to unregister RSEC temporarily across your clone and re-register it after. So, but the question is whether for new, uh, more recent kernels, for clone VM and clone uh, set TLS, do we want to also have a behavior of clearing that? But again, uh, older kernels don't do it. So we end up, I mean, that, that's kind of an ABI change that user space has no way to know about. So yeah, yeah. On the other hand, I think we have all seen uh, more drastic changes in kernel behavior in after a longer time. I mean, the feature is pretty new at this point. So I don't know. I, I'm, Kernel kind of de developer decisions are really not my my, my strong point, um, but for for fork I I've, I think there's no problem because you can mm -hmm. just copy everything. Um, I was was interesting what's going to happen if you are in a restartable restartable sequence and call v fork. <laughs> so yeah. we disallow that. Uh, you can build your kernel with a, a debug option that uh, adds validation at every syscall, syscall, and it's going to kill your process if you do any syscall within a RSEC critical section. So it's explicitly disallowed by the kernel. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, that, that, but that, that's kind of riddle, right? Uh, um, if you, uh, suppose you call clock get time from, from the RSEC, critical section, and it depends whether you can use the VDSO optimization or not, whether you do the system call. Uh, you cannot even do a function call from a RSEC critical section, because then your IP is not within the range anymore. So this is really just an inline assembly, and that's it. Okay. I cannot, yeah. It doesn't have to be inline assembly. Yeah, it can be a dot .s that you call, and then you do everything in the dot .s, that, that works, yeah. So it's a uh, unsigned in 64 offset. Yeah, the post commit offset. So this is really the length of the critical section. So it could be huge. Uh, yeah, it could be. Hmm. 
someone could create a non-functional non program, program with that by saying, I, I have a critical section that, uh, for which the duration is one hour, and you're certain to be preempted, and it's always going to abort, and you're never going to progress. And yes, that's, that's what we have. Right, but, but it does mean it could be multiple functions. Multiple functions? Well, yeah. you said... Oh, it, it as long as they are all covered by this, right. yes. Yeah. But none of those uh, can issue a system call. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the kernel developers have put that limit on purpose when I said, yeah, but with fork, <laughs> within a critical section, it kind of doesn't work. And they were like, no, 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 no. Uh, we are going, we're going to completely disallow doing system calls within our sec critical section. That, that was actually the, the, the case I came up with that added a lot of complexity in the kernel to be handled correctly. They said, no, we don't put that complexity there, we disallow it. I mean, from a malloc perspective, we can still access the arenas. We can, like, if you have, you can still try an atomic to take a lock, you can still update data structures, you can still walk lists, you can do all sorts of stuff. There's going to be some limits to it, but Florian has it. There's a mic right beside you. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the problem is that on some architectures, atomics are actually function calls, so... He, you yeah. have to know what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, yeah but uh, look at IH64 and the LSE uh, Millie code thing that I think Richard Henderson posted for GCC somewhere recently. And <laughs> you need, basically, you need to, to version the, uh, the RSEC stuff so that you don't need any sort of high funk like uh, dispatching for the atomics. Well, um, you're saying because the iFunk dispatch could end up wanting to look at the type of machine that it's on? And no, no, no. Uh, you can't, uh, at the iFunk interaction, you can't use because then you drop out of the, the, the critical yeah, section. Yeah, you drop so out of the critical section. But uh, it, that could, be, uh, it could be happen for the atomic build ins in the compiler. So you need to really be really careful. The atomic built-ins might actually be implemented using function calls. Uh, sure. I, I, so I think that RSEC has many of the same difficulties that we have with iFunk as to what are you allowed to run within an iFunk handler. And yeah. It's the same problems as what are you allowed to run within this restartable sequence. Yep. Because if there's anything in that sequence that has a relocation against it, you don't know what the dynamic linker will resolve that relocation yeah, against. But if you if you need to write it in assembly anyway, then uh, it's going to be fine because you can control the relocation types and sure. the, the types of atomics I, being if, used. But again, it's the same problem as iFunk handlers where you know you yeah. could write your iFunk handlers all in assembly. And we have many iFunk handlers actually written in assembly in glibc for that purpose, where it's just like check a flag, do the thing, check a flag, do the thing, check a flag, do the thing. and the what I like about this is that we're not limiting anybody, and in the same with iFunk handlers, we didn't limit anybody, but I mean, maybe we do a better job documenting the rules for this so that we know what we're not supposed to do. I mean, for iFunk, we have the same problem, because it has to run super early, and you have to only do a finite number of things and set something up, so. And by the way, I don't know if uh, at thread exit if signals get disabled or not, but this is also another thing we should maybe consider. Uh, because a handler could layer after the registration. The so after, after unregistration, yeah, yeah, before um, thread total death. But is that really a problem on the glibc side because uh, the kernel will do the deregistration for us, right? It will do it, but I think we do it explicitly now because I don't entirely trust that the uh, lifetime of the TLS is actually uh, spawns across the, uh, until that thread really cease to exist and be schedulable by the kernel. So if the kernel can write to this after it's been uh, freed, I see, I that's see. an issue. Yeah, we, can, we need to audit this and yeah. uh, see well, what's the easiest way out there. Yeah. What, what do you mean? So what's the actual issue? Um, so uh, I think for static TLS allocation, we are fine today because it's on the stack. So <laughs> you can't pull away the stack while the thread exists. Yeah, and everything is going to yeah, be IE and libc, though. Uh, we have some some discussions about changing the way we allocate the TCP and the static TLS area. And at that point, in theory, we could deallocate the TLS area 
before the thread exits on the same thread. Yeah. Uh, basically to save the location, by, because it's a separate resource. Yeah. And at that point, we won't need to add an explicit registration before that. That's a good point. But yeah. today, we won't need it because it can we Can we ever do that, though? Because clear TID from the kernel needs a mapping to clear into that space for the thread. How do we? And the only thing we have right now is is um, uh, clones, you don't, you clone don't clear need to, TID or yeah. whatever it's called right now because it's a clear plus a few. Yeah, but that it doesn't that. need to be in the TCP, right? It doesn't. No, you're right. Yeah, we, I see what you're saying. So it's deallocate TLS, leave some memory left yeah, for, the, for the clear that, TID. That is something we 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 need to put in a comment at that place where where we do that kind of memory management. That's a good point. Yeah, but, but today today we we don't have that problem because it's on the stack and we don't deallocate the stack while the thread is alive. But but despite I mean like it says uh, Matthew writes thread local storage there, but that's not doesn't have to be the case. So glibc could have allocated a piece of memory that's got enough space for the TID and the TCB and an RSEC ABI. And then we could throw everything else away and then leave this piece around, right? A tiny uh, no, yeah, but it no, we work wouldn't with want to. Okay. It has to be in a static TLS area if applications access it directly because of the, uh, the quasi copy relocation behavior of TLS data and in statically linked applications. Uh, yeah, yeah. If an application I mean, also. Yeah. We are yeah. going way yeah. off place yeah. Yeah. here. So yeah, yeah. For but you, the, the current state is it's not something you need to yeah. worry about. We need to add a comment there in the code that we yeah. keep and it in sync with future changes. But, but just be aware that if uh, at thread uh, exit, anything re uh, relies, let's say, on, let's, oh, we disable signal to make sure that nobody else than ourselves touch the, 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 the TLS, this is not enough for our, our sec because you can be preempted even if you are a, uh, in a region where you have blocked all signals and the kernel may try to touch that data when rescheduling you. So, so you have to be really, really careful if you try to remove the unregistration that you don't have such assumptions. Disabling mm -hmm. signals is not disabling the kernel from actually preempting you and touching the TLS. Well, I mean, we face the same problem from a protocol perspective with Clear TID and unmapping those regions anyway too. So, uh, not not sorry, not that um, set robust list where the kernel has to clear the robust list pointer, and we end up unmapping, potentially unmapping things, and then the kernel touches yeah. different memory that belongs to the next thread. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, yeah. There, uh, but it's it's in the current implementation because the TCP mm -hmm. is on the stack. It doesn't matter. Yes, so today it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it may matter. Yeah. So. so at the glibc side, is there any other actions required on my side or, sh or should, wait, uh, should wait for you guys to come up with fixes for the uh, observed problems and uh, then rebase my stuff? Do we have documentation for the manual? Is, is the RSEC uh, uh, manual? So I submitted it uh, to Michael Karisk uh, for no, man pages? No, I mean oh. for, for the glibc manual. Uh, What's there to document? Yeah. What do we want to, well, what do we want to document, I guess? Uh, yeah, the, the public interface, the ABI as such. Oh, yeah, document RSEC ABI. Which is part of the kernel UAPIs, and it's documented by the kernel uh, system called man page. It's Do not yeah, upstream yet, I but mean, uh, we, should yeah. document it. we should document something. <laughs> yeah, we should right? mention something there. And, and we, have, we have a threads section, and we should uh, mention something about the symbol and what it means. I mean, and, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the problem, I, I, from my perspective, I think we should all try to improve uh, Mike Hag's uh, yeah. Man Pages project. But uh, people, the, the, count, the request is even for system call wrappers, and this is basically very much like a system call wrapper. We have text in the manual for everything. So, yeah. Yeah. so we might end up duplicating that. But yeah. the thing is, uh, so I, I, I've been waiting for a few months for feedback from Michael, and I picked him uh, quite a few times. And he has some, some nice improvements mm -hmm. he wants to do to, uh, to, to that man page before he merged it. But I, I, I don't want to kind of diverge the two different routes. I mean, I'd like to have the kernel man page upstream, yeah. and then we can select what is needed for yeah. GLBC. But we're, I'm stuck at the kernel man page. Okay. Well. So, I mean, yeah. we, did, we did very similar things for the multi-threaded safety, asynchronous safety stuff. And Michael and I have shared 
and license wise have shared code across both projects and to some true. degree. So I think, yeah, we would document them in the manual and then document something similar in glibc. Uh, so yeah, uh, and one more min minor thing was the volatile qualifier on, I think that's gun in the latest iteration or that. Yeah, I want uh, to remove it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't really like it. You should l use rela relaxed memory uh, order uh, instructions for loading that uh, data and then it will be fine. Okay, so we have two things. We have the loader in libc private uh, API for setting up the TLS region early enough for main thread only. And then for created threads with pthread create, we have the blocking signals during early initialization till the thread is at a state where we want any observable differences to be notable by a, a signal handler. Yeah, and look at on registration as well uh, when it exits to see if there's an observable state just after regi on registration. I guarantee you there is, but what do we have to do there? Well, the the, the unregistered uh, that that we don't. Can do we just not do it? Yeah, we, uh, we don't have to do it today. In, in the current implementation, because it's initial exec TLS, it's going to go into the static TLS area, which is on the thread. So there's no action to be taken. The kernel. Will the, the threat will terminate before we deallocate the stack? Correct. I mean, yeah. So today, <laughs> your patch, you have an action item then. We don't need the unregistration. Perfect. Because today in libcso.6, it's an initial exec model, so that's going to reside on the stack or the thread. The thread stack won't go away until the kernel issues the TID clear in Futex wake which will allow then libc to actually either reuse or reclaim the stack space. So Good. we're waiting for the kernel to signal death. Now if the kernel messes up and touches things after it issues that, that write plus the wake, That's then a kernel problem. kernel problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, but it would suck to have to fix. We'd have to go back and change stuff, so. Yeah, we, we actually have the problem that the kernel signals thread exit before the thread is gone today from a resource accounting perspective. But that's just resource accounting. You never yeah. expect the kernel to touch that memory after. I don't know what the kernel will do there, but, but it de depends on where ASIC is hooked into. So we have perhaps an action item to double check what happens at the kernel level uh, after uh, this uh, uh, XID or the. Uh, it's clone yeah. child, what's it? Clone child clear TID? Yeah. yeah. It's, a cl it's one of the clone yeah. flags to So indicate when this happens, yeah. uh, is it possible that the scheduler will uh, reschedule schedule again that thread or not? I mean, no code will execute at that point, but. Yeah. What does that mean from a kernel perspective? I don't know. Yeah, but I can check it. That yeah. can be an action yeah. item yeah. on so my and for, for your next patch, uh, for the Lapitha question and the deregistration, maybe add a comment uh, yeah. to the code so that we remember to check this if we change the TLS allocation. Yeah. But I think that's it. I mean, we need to figure out what to do about on the, uh, for, for the dynamic loader integration. That, that's, I think that's up to us. Yeah, okay. To us. Yeah, it, it, okay. It, it won't happen like uh, tomorrow because uh, we have other applications this week and then mm -hmm. Uh, there's some PTO coming up for me, so please be a little bit more patient. I no problem. Know that. <laughs> Would you say we yeah. are on track for getting this into glibc 231? I think so. Yeah, we can. We. Yeah. I. I. I yeah. It's. It's like I should add a, add a some sort of disclaimer here, but I really want to make it this release, and we should be able to do that. So I. Yeah. I mean, I the ASIC handle stuff was uh, for me the major. The, the major blocker for me because that seems to be a lot of complexity t for something that is at best temporary or never actually going to be used at all. <laughs> yeah. So if we can get rid of that with a little bit of extra work we need any way to do for cleanup purposes then. It, I mean, and it, I think by no way means that we don't, like I agree with your goal of making a transition feasible so that users today can use the library yep. and then when they upgrade it doesn't break. Yep. That is absolutely like noble goal like number one is to make sure that you can do a smooth transition to a functioning glibc that does the registration for you. So yeah, it's just on the mean, uh, yeah. making sure that uh, no signal handler, no application can observe the the, the transient state yeah. is, uh, I think, a much better way to fix that. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it should help help with robustness because that's basically an edge case that's very hard to test. Yeah. A question from Pedro. Yeah. Hey, actually the question is from Tom, but he was too embarrassed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know the answer, <laughs> uh, or at least fully. Uh, uh, going back to the debugger interface. Yes. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, I think you had a different slide, but anyway. Uh, oh, that, there you go, yeah. So about the, um, those symbol names, I guess those are symbols, um, to uh, how, how can the debugger tell whether you're inside one of those regions and where no. do they end? So uh, they uh, so are actual sections. So those are additional sections added to the ELF binary that are made available to the debugger. So they, the debugger see it as arrays of that stuff. So the, okay. there's an array of the, the, the uh, RSEC CS pointers is actually pointing to, let me go back, pointing to those struct RSEC CS, which have the start IP, post commit offset, and abort IP. It has that part of the information. Okay. And then the RSEC exit point array section. So, I mean, those uh, critical sections may have different exit points, right? So, uh, it's not, so, so when it ends, uh, so the start IP plus the offset, that's one exit point, of course. But you may have other exit points. So, you, so those are emitted in this other section. And they are tied to, uh, to so, so you can reconstruct what is all the information you need for a single critical section mm -hmm. by linking those exit points uh, with the start IP. So the start IP is the unique, unique key you use to uh, identify a critical section. You go over those arrays, you look at everything that targets that start IP, and this is all you need to basically understand what's, where you and need to put the breakpoint to skip over. But doesn't, don't those exit points, doesn't that IP, isn't that still within the region? Um, isn't that like a jump to outside? So you need to put a breakpoint at the target of the jump? Yeah, it can be a jump outside. So you can't just put a breakpoint there because that will cause an abort. And you can't upfront know the destination of the jump because it can be an indirect jump and wait, the wait, register wait. is not filled yet. So if it's jumping out, it's actually, oh, it can be a conditional jump. Or an indirect jump and you yeah. don't know the value of the register at that point, it's not yeah. filled in yet. So you want to look at the target of the jump. And it's not determinable upfront unless you're actually stopped at that location. Yeah. Uh, the idea is like to implement this in GDB, you know, like you're stepping through your program and you, you hit the start of a sequence. And so in, you hit, you, you type step and GDB instead of single stepping sets a breakpoint at all the possible yeah. things after the section and then does it continue. The question is how do you find the actual places to set these breakpoints? Because if you miss a breakpoint, what happens is the user types step and the program just goes off and they are confused. Yeah, I'll have to, to recheck some, some stuff. Uh, perhaps le let's discuss just after this, because uh, I, I may have an issue in my headers. It's very likely uh, because I think the, so, so I don't recall, uh, but I don't think I, I, I specify the target of the, well, actually, let's, uh, let's have a look. We have time. Uh, is it large enough? Not quite, sorry. Uh, let's make it a bit uh, larger. Zoom in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of uh, compare and store. Uh, we define the table here. We define the exit points there. So it's the label compare fail. And that label compare fail ends up being here. This is an ASM go to. And that compare fail is the actual target outside. So we define the target of the jump as the exit point. So you should be good. So you'd be, so you'd be placing at, uh, so the start is one F here. 
and one F is defined right here when we define, sorry for all the macros, but this is what makes it understandable. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the one, one F is there, it's the one here. So this is the entry point in the critical section. Uh, then we have plus the size, uh, so the commit is at 2F, so the 2F is just after the final store here. So uh, we basically have uh, our offset, uh, and at 2F, this is one exit point, which is identified within the RSXES defined by, by this defined table. Then we have the, those three exit points, and this is really just for testing. So the compare twice is I do multiple comparisons, and I, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff there to reproduce errors, but that's the exit point we care about. So the, com the comparison, when it fails, so we have the comparison is there, jump if not zero, it goes to the compare fail label, and that compare fail label is a ASM Gutu label here, which ends up being, okay, let's return one, which means we have failed. So the address is outside. And what about the entry point? That's the key part. So the entry point, let's have a look. Define table 1F, so it's the ASM store R6 CS. Sorry, I had all that in my head a couple of years ago, but currently I really have to look at the code. So you're, you're single stepping, step, 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 and then suddenly you step into the region at the first instruction of the region, and just that stepping into the region aborts it already, doesn't it? So you're, you're saying you need a marker for the instruction before. Before. And, but Which the, is the other, the exit markers are fine because Matthew you're saying they're all outside, so you can set breakpoints on all the targets. And you hope the user does it right, because if they implement it wrong, then it then the step becomes a continue. And, and and having a marker for the instruction before, it's okay unless you have unless you have jumps, jumps into to, into the first instruction. The first instruction. Uh, what's the you need like a could you do with a flag on the sick trap signal that it's a, due to an ASIC. So, uh, I'll take a board, and then you need to hunt for the exit uh, exit location, and set a breakpoint there. Yeah, but that would be end up in the abort anyway. Or would you? Are you suggesting something like then the debugger cancels the abort? I have I have a thing though. What if the kernel knows not to abort if you got interrupted? before the critical section happened, right at the very beginning. Yeah, okay, so, so a few- Before the instruction was actually executed. A few very point. important points there. First of all, there is an optimization in RSEC uh, in which, so at the end of the critical section, we don't need to clear the RSEC CS pointer at all. It's the kernel which will clear it lazily when it preempts and it notices it's not nested on top of a critical section. So that makes impossible the thing you want me to do here. But the, the way the, the, the beginning of the critical section is done, so we have this store to the RSXCS storing the pointer, and that pointer is, is actually the address of the instruction right after. And perhaps this is something that should be more clearly documented, okay. But uh, so by doing so, uh, so we store and immediately after we start executing, uh, so we have, so the kernel has knowledge that it is within a critical section right when it is here. You want you to put your breakpoint outside of that critical section. So let's see, uh, is the right place here or uh, the store right after or, or right may, before? Maybe the kernel could not, uh, could, could be made not to abort the uh, sequence if the instruction that was executed was a, an, a trap. Uh, this is this is ABI exposed today, and it has been for a couple okay. of years. So I, I mean, unless we really need to change the kernel ABI, let's try not to do it. Okay. Okay. We, we need to hash this out somehow. Yep. Uh, and usually we would uh, use. I think we would use dwarf information for this stuff, and not uh, ta data tables in a separate section, right? For 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 guiding the debugger how to deal with these uh, things. Yeah. At first I had understood it was just simple names, like in the elf symbol table, that had some kind of pattern. Like uh, this is a start, it looks like underscore underscore uh, rsec start. That's why I understood but it, but you're saying it's separate sections with yep. data structures. Yep. So, so I guess it works even without work. 
it, it would be like the C tours and init's dot init's and click. Yeah. Um, so the the it's not an abort section, but when I uh, get into my abort, how do I determine why and from where I was aborted? Uh, well, I mean, there's no inf okay. So you'd like to know at which point within the critical section the the preemption happened. Yeah. So yeah. so. For, for for example, if I'm instrumenting the critical section, rewriting and blah, blah, and then it gets aborted, I want to know was it aborted because of my instrumentation of that critical section or yeah. There, there's no uh, there's no data that provides you that. There, there there's nothing in that mechanism that exposes uh, at which instruction pointer it has been aborted. So there there's nothing like that. Uh, okay, the kernel okay. has really limited capabilities when it's moving this instruction pointer in. There's nowhere to store that information in a safe way. Yeah, I, I think if you need that information, you've written it wrong. Pretty yeah, but, <laughs> but, but it, it's, it, yeah. it looks like a signal. I would know where the signal is. Well, it's not even looks like a signal. It looks like software transactional memory. Yep. And in an STM environment, you generally have some knowledge of, you know, after. So you've got an X start, an X, sorry, an X begin, and an X end. Yeah. You have an abort, and then you have yeah. reason codes and things for why the abort happened. So, um, but it's it's okay. I mean, like, it, sure, an actor, you you, well, in this case, it's a, it's STM. So the rollback is entirely on your like. You have to figure right. out how to clean yeah. up whatever you had. The question is, how do you know how much to roll back? <laughs> you don't. You just have to. You have to consider that you could have aborted anywhere in the in the software critic the software transactional memory region. Everything needs to be cleaned up if yeah. it possibly happened. Correct. So it is a, there is a there is a conceptual limit to the kind of things you can write within the oh, restartable sequence. Yeah, and by the yeah, fair point. Yeah. So uh, typical critical sections written with RSEC have one main key limitations. So you have a huge pos well, a, a preparation phase where you do no side effects, and then you have a final store instruction, and that's it. So this is. Basically, don't do any side, other side effects that are observable outside uh, other than this final store. Uh, so it enables tons of use cases, but it's fairly limited, yes. Uh, th there is one case, however. So you can do a ring buffer that has uh, all the preparation phase is our mem copies into a ring buffer. And then as a final store, you update the actual produced offset. So what happens is if you get aborted while doing this mem copy, well, it's just going to be overwritten, so you don't care. So this is a case where you can have stores that are not just the final commit. I have a question about the abort handler. If the only purpose of your abort is to restart the sequence, is it legal to set the abort handler to point to the beginning of the critical section itself? As I recall, I think I've documented that it needs to be outside of the, of the region. How far outside? Oh, it can be next instruction. Or the previous instruction? I think it could, yeah. So you could have a no op just before your critical insect that is the abort handler just to restart. Yeah. Uh, it, it isn't your uh, thingy there, or is that a not the, the signature? Uh, yes, the signature, let's have a look. It's at the define abort that is right here. So I have my final store right here, of Q. Uh, the, la the label here, uh, forget about the inject ASM, this is for testing. And then right after I have put the abort, so it's labeled four, and how I did the abort handler on x86 is to put that abort handler in a separate section. And it starts with the signature here, which is an undefined instruction that will define a, generate the tra a trap. And then the dot long is the actual signature va value for x86, uh, which is this one. But the signature goes before the abort handler, so yep. the abort handler can go before the critical section, uh, so that the yeah. net result of so an abort within the critical section is simply to restart the critical section. If your abort handler is, if, well, if your abort handler is just a no op, yep. your memory goes signature, no op, critical section. If anything goes wrong with the critical section, it goes back to the no op, it just starts again. 
It would just, it would be basically become a busy loop that, that only busy loops if you get preempted. Yeah, but I think the no-up may not work because I think you need the store of the, uh, to the RSXCS to be just before the beginning of your critical section. Uh, because well, you open up your abort handler window. is your store CS. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So that would be what is just before, yeah, the equivalent of your knob. Yeah. A uh, question from Pedro at the back. Just as a generic question, maybe for those of us who are getting introduced to this yeah. at the first time, how, as I say, you say your critical section pushes something on the stack. How does the abort handler know how much to unwind? Uh, does it have some like a way to tell which instruction was running or something? No, no, not not at all. Yeah, don't do that. So just don't, don't touch do registers and, or anything. <laughs> so, but if you have a sequence with four instructions, if you aborted an instruction one, what you have to unwind is this. No. So 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 don't push anything on the stack within the critical section. However, you can push things on the reserve space on the stack in the inline SM before the start of your critical section, as long as every exit point end up undoing what you've done. That works, but you cannot do it, do it within the critical section because you never know where you're going to be preempted right. and aborted. So. Okay, so answer is don't do it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, okay. the, going back to the debugger thing, can you just answer this? Is it, is it possible just to say never jump to the first instruction? Uh, of, of a, is that not doable by now? Like, could, no, could we define the instruction, uh, the, the sequence to always start with a knob that's outside of the sequence? So that would be the location you would put a break point. Uh, and anyway, that would mean that any so jump to a, a, a sequence would I think land at a knob. I think what you are talking about, so for the entry into the critical section in order to put a break point, I think it would be okay to simply put the breakpoint in the instruction that comes before the start IP of the critical section. And that will always be okay. Because if you have a jump, as you say, to that very first instruction, it means that between the instruction that did the store to the RSXCS and the first instruction of your critical section, you had a jump. And that leaves a window for the kernel to clear your registration. Those, so, so this case is incorrect. You cannot do it. Uh, so, you, so yeah, I mean, so you, you cannot have a jump to the first instruction of your RSXES because the instruction just before needs to be the store that registers the start IP. So that's perfect. So that's where we want to pay, place our breakpoint before. All right. Yeah, that works. Yeah, the detection about that exactly. But let, let's have another pass at the man page to make sure that yeah. all those uh, corner cases are clear. Yeah. Could you theoretically use hardware transactions within an RSEC sequence to kind of expand the <laughs> functionality, I guess? <laughs> Interesting Drama. question. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that uh, if, uh, if you figure out it works or not, or I've not considered it at all. <laughs> Yeah, so the, uh, the back to, uh, I thought you said the kernel doesn't de-register -re the, uh, the restartable section when it falls out. Um, so how, how do you know which one is active? So when another critical section will uh, start, just before there is a store that will update this pointer to its own descriptor. But before that happens, you end up in a situation where you are running non-critical section code yeah. with this pointer set. Yes. So the kernel is actually going to check whether the current instruction pointer is within the range of that specific critical section. And if it's outside, it's going to clear that pointer. Yes. No, I'm, 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 so it, it's more from, uh, so these data sections are all uh, kind of helpers. Yeah. I have to observe the 
uh, track local air sex tract to know which of them is active for a specific track. Yeah. But they are, th there isn't something I can observe that sets them because that's just user code. So, I mean, it, they're being set by the instruction that comes just before the start IP, uh, but they're never cleared. It's the kernel that's going to clear them, or the program exi exits, or uh, eventually uh, another RSEC CS, uh, is another critical section starts and just overwrites that, that value. Yeah, yeah but it, it's more from a, the, I have to just assume that they are all active uh, uh, restartable sections. Yeah. Hmm. I think I have another action item for you here. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have to do uh, have to update the uh, CS pointer on DL close <laughs> because we are going to unmap code? Just one second. Uh, was it a flush? Uh, there's actually some API in there. Yeah, RSEC prepare unload should be invoked by each thread executing a RSEC critical section at least once between their last critical section and library unload. So it's documented in there, in my libraries. So user space, the RSEC user need to take care of that. Yeah, but shouldn't we do put it into DL clause itself? I mean, that seems That could to be, be a very good thing yeah. to do, yeah. Yeah, okay, let's do that then. Why? Because you don't want the current, so okay. When the kernel is looking at uh, the uh, RSEC EBI, so it observes that a struct RSEC CS is currently registered, and it's going to want to look at the struct RSEC CS to see the start IP, the, oh. the offset, and everything. And that might have been unmapped by ADL close. Yeah. Excellent point. Any other questions? I think we're over time, but I don't think anyone is kind of waiting at the door to kick us out, so that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> exactly. And you live here. <laughs> and I live here, right? <laughs> One more question here. Well, if we are gone uh, on anyway. So, um, uh, normally you would expect uh, uh, just before the critical section to uh, that the, the, the RSEC pointer is set. So what you could do is have a hardware uh, watch point for the RSEC. Setting the, the pointer, yeah. Setting and then yeah. you know, oh, probably now we're going into, maybe that's. That could be another uh, option, no. however, there's okay. a. There's a limited number of hardware watch points, whereas you can put a pretty much infinite number of breakpoints in the code. Yeah. So, but that's up to GDB developers to, and, and you to, to decide. Well, I think the kernel no longer supports per thread watch points. It used to do uh, so before like 260, 2634 or something like that nowadays. Uh, you have to have uh, only you have only global watch points anymore, mm. and that means uh, if you have like 15 threads or so, then you don't have enough hardware watch points. Yeah, fair point. So it was about using hardware watch points on the RSEC CS uh, field of the uh, RSEC EBI structure to identify whether we have those tours kind of starting a critical section. Uh, Any other questions? Oh, one more, yeah. Carlos. Okay, so RSEC is the start of a long road towards other system calls that do similar things. Yes. So you, this presentation is like, I, you know, I don't want to say you're a snake oil salesman, but like you're like, hey, try this drink, kids. And then you've got like three other drinks in the background. So um, I would like to hear from you about the future direction of this kind of work because RSEC is 
Manhattan is the beginning of something that is a longer story. So those of us here who are implementing these things in, in user space, it could be useful for us to know what's coming next, because there's OPV after this, and then there's something else you've been talking to the kernel people about. And so uh, what, what I'd like before we walk out of this room is for you to make it clear to the rest of us here what else comes after this yeah. is just one piece. So I have, I have tons of ideas, limited time to implement them, but here are a few uh, of those. So, so first thing I want to solve is uh, remote per CPU data accesses with RSEC. That's the first thing I want to solve. But now, when you talk more generally about the concept of having a thread local storage structure as an ABI to exchange information between the kernel and user space, it can be used for many things. One of the ideas I had would be to have uh, to use that or an extension of it to have uh, uh, to visit block signals from user space without calling the kernel. So that would be one thing that might be really nice. Um, so, are, are we officially out of the room or we can go on a little bit? Uh, I, I've been sort of encouraged to come in and just remind you that it's gone, up, uh, gone three o'clock. So, um, <laughs> you know, it should you see your way to... And, yeah. and there's tea and coffee outside, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so, if I can just quickly wrap up in this yeah. case. Uh, so, uh, si signal disabling is one, uh, having information about node ID, anything that, has to, that is local to a CPU or uh, invariant for a, a process and, and needs to be frequently accessed, rather than doing a cache in user space that might happen to be wrong, having the kernel publish that in such a, a trade local storage. Uh, yeah, exactly. TID, TID, for sure. Exactly, exactly. Um, so those are... Um, uh, other things that, uh, and uh, so there are some other things they want to do at Google to have some kind of virtualized CPU number as well in there. Uh, so, I mean, th there's a long list of things that people want to do with this that would allow user space to do much more without calling the kernel. Yeah, but for OPV, is the, the idea there, isn't it, that we get to also write to another CPU's uh, CPU local data, which yeah. means that that there are, rather than like, you know, you were talking about this, like, rather than having generation counters or other things that threads need to check when they've been actively scheduled to determine if things have changed, you could just say, I'm going to update like you're doing with the timeouts in uh, the uh, LTT and GUST yep. ring buffer, where you yep. want to go to every CPU's yep. ring buffer and do a timeout. GLIPC might have an idea, or the debugger might want to go and touch every thread's something and yep. have a way to do that. Okay, so that's OPV, but OPV yeah, is not going to get in the kernel because Linus says, until not. you show me that user space is using RSEC, I'm not going to let you get your next crazy idea into the kernel. Exactly. So, exactly. Okay. So we now need to get something in glibc that uh, presents an ABI that everyone can use, and then we'll have users, okay. and we'll have a stronger case to get other things in the kernel. Okay. What's after OPV? Nothing? Uh, and it's not OPV now. My current okay. version is due on CPU. Do on CPU. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Whatever. I mean, OPV was like fixed number of instructions you can execute on a CPU emulated, but do on CPU, fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so I do. I have patches for a Node ID information, uh, okay. and uh, but at some point it's going to depend on what are the end users in user space requesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I'll not make the roadmap. I mean, I don't want to push technology no, no, just for okay. the sake of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for this very lively discussion. Thank you.